Hello and welcome to this special episode of Beers and Bites with your co-host Chris Jordan from Fluency Security and Jeremy Murdershaw from Fortify 24 by 7. Today's special guest is Brett Scott from Tech Data. You'll find that Brett has a lot of illuminating information and has a lot to share in the world of cybersecurity. We're very much looking forward to those discussions today. Uh, with that, Chris, why don't you start us off with the type of beer that you have today? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with the three notch. This time it's a, it's a, a juicy IPA, but oh, look at I can't even get the light. Once again, just blows everything out. I don't know how to ever do these things correctly. I took an Instagram though. So yeah, you can just yeah. follow it on Instagram. <laughs> but this is the, uh, the Cascade Whirlpool. It's, it's, it's a, I don't know why people start keep on putting fruit in my beer, but this is a, this is a grapefruit one, you know, and uh, I'm going to try it out. Maybe it's, you know how people used to do grapefruit for diet. So this is my new grapefruit diet. I think that's where I'm going Ooh. with this one. That's right. like a solid plan. Man, I open it up and it just wafts with the, the grapefruit. I mean, there, it's you almost... go. there you go. <laughs> Jeremy, what do you have today? Well, keeping in the fruity uh, vein, I've got the, the uh, stone, uh, they call it the Notorious Pog, right? It's pine, it was a passion orange and guava beer. A little wow. bit low on the percentage, but it's big on the size. So that's good. <laughs> All right. Brett, what are you bringing to the table today? So I'm going with the stock Stella. Uh, it's a great beer. I drink a lot of it, and I'm pretty sure I'm keeping them personally in business. There you go. <laughs> and <laughs> for myself, who for myself Stella, Jeremy? we're coming up with a Cloud 8. It's a hazy. Nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the Cloud 8. I good. don't know about it being fruity, but uh, we'll see what the hazy does for us. Hazy's nice. I like the hazy <laughs> techniques. So is that is that a Bevco? What's the uh, Bevco for that owns uh, Stellar nowadays? That's a Budweiser one, wasn't I don't know. it? I don't know what the German name one. Is. All right, we'll, 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 we'll Google that one later. That's, that's all I need to know. Oh wow, that's actually pretty good. Hazy IPA. Oh yeah, it's solid, solid. So with that, uh, Brett, if you don't mind uh, introducing yourself to our guests and just telling us a little bit about your background and then what you are doing today, uh, especially with the cyber warfare range. Awesome. Well, thank you, sir. My name is Brett Scott. I'm currently titled the Director of Security Enablement and Training. And if you don't like that title, if you give it about six months, uh, it'll change. Uh, the most interesting part of being me at Tech Data is I only find out about my title changes on other people's presentations. And so I'll sit there and they'll be talking about the you know org chart and things like that. And I'll look and I'll say I have a different dial. And then I'll be like, oh, do I have a different dial now? And then they're like, oh, yeah, we, uh, we changed your title. So I have seven business cards, and I've only been there six years. So uh, that will give you an idea of how fast, often my title changes. So Director of Security Enablement and Training this week. Um, what I do is mostly <laughs> strategic work with Tech Data, and right now I oversee the Tech Data Cyber Range, which is a partnership with the National Cyber Warfare Foundation, and that is the foundation's first corporate range and it has been a wild success. I opened up in the middle of November of last year. And uh, in the first 90 days, uh, we closed an additional $100 million in business just because of the range that we can point to transactionally. It's actually a much larger number, but I can specifically point out the transactions themselves that make that number 100 million. Okay, so, so Brett, I've been there. Great facility, great place to show stuff off. But when people say cyber range, actually, I made the mistake of going someplace and somebody keeps on putting stupid ads following me around on cyber range. So can you can enlighten us what a cyber range is. Obviously it's not like uh, Aberdeen proving grounds where I have to wear things over my heads for this. So what's going on with the, with the cyber range What you guys, what, what's going on? What, what, what do you do there? Why, why is it important? Well, you don't have to wear protective gear yet, but let's not rule that out. Um, so most people, when they talk about cyber ranges, what they mean is a computer lab, right? And so, you know, there's a gigantic difference between what is a cyber range and what people call cyber range. And the difference is knowing what the heck is going on, but the purpose of a cyber range is just like a gunnery range, right? Where you are essentially, you are testing out equipment. You're testing to see how resilient it is, how well it fends off attacks, you subject it to torture, 
you do all the things that you do and into that cauldron, if you will, a caustic cauldron of, of uh, chaos, I might have the phraseology on this one, um, you actually can inject people who will then learn from all of that chaos and they can learn hands-on very quickly and develop practical skill sets in cybersecurity. So attack, defend, investigate, all of those things are byproducts of education uh, as part of operating a live fire cyber range. Now, um, one of the reasons why Tech Data's cyber range is different than everybody else is because no one's ever going to let you do this. Uh, you know, for all the rhetoric and all the spend that people have, um, there is a bureaucrat or a lawyer just waiting to tell them no. Uh, no, you can't do this. You can't have, tell people how to breach a system. You can't uh, teach people. Um, how to investigate crime or develop PII over the internet or OSINT. We can't do that. The law won't let us do that. And so uh, that is, again, knowledge, right? You, you, you don't know what you can and cannot do by law. You always err to the side of caution. And so everybody's cyber range is always going to be a computer lab, which is just a much more cooler way of saying, I got a bunch of computers over there and they're running stuff. Um, so. Uh, the foundation has, since 2012, operated a cyber range. We teach you the practical skill set with the basic premise, and you're starting to hear the, the industry begin to echo this statement. How can you possibly defend against an enemy you do not understand, right? So long before there were computers, um, a guy named Sun Tzu said, if you do not understand your enemy, you're going to lose half your battles, right? And so this is not a computer thing. This is a doctrine of war thing, and that's really simple. If you really want to get into the un uh, true understanding of why everybody fails at cybersecurity so badly so often, it's because they do not understand their enemy. And even people who are in the, let's say the classified world, are essentially forbidden from learning these very practical skills, even when the weapons that they're fending themselves, uh, defending themselves against were stolen from our government. Yes. So. It's the craziest thing. They go into our armory and they steal this really potent weapon. And our government says, if you learn about that weapon, we're going to kick you out of the club. And so that's just, if you will, that is, uh, uh, I like to say, uh, Dr. Strangelove security think, right? Where essentially this is you know, born of the 50s. It's never matured. And the idea is if we don't talk about it, if we can make it go away. And of course, every day, it shows us that's a flaw strategy. So fundamentally, um, a cyber warfare range is a transformation agent. And what we do is we, in, we engage people with the real world knowledge of cybersecurity. And we, in, in living in this environment, this caustic environment, you're developing a practical skill set that is unparalleled. And so even though everyone understands what we're doing, we tell people what we're doing, no one can ever repeat it because a you have to have the knowledge that's not that's not common b you have to have the courage and then c you have to know how to do it legally and so all three of those things essentially uh make us a very separate very isolated island which i enjoy uh and uh we are because of that everyone knows that we're different and so what's neat about that in cybersecurity, everything is about credibility and almost everybody has <clears throat> a million reasons and a million examples they could point to about how XYZ entity or human or company, et cetera, is just not credible in cybersecurity because they, they do the dumbest things. And so when you offer credibility, everyone else that's kind of serious about the job immediately comes to you. It's like a magnet. It's one of the very few things in the, on earth where if you build it, they actually come. So what are the who's what are the verticals that are buying this right now? I mean, is it mostly government or commercial, or is it banking? What's what's who's, everybody? So um, the uh, not surprisingly, we weren't open a week before all of a sudden all of the non-existent entities within the government showed up and are like, "Hey, we want to be friends." And I'm like, "That's great. This is the corporate range, and if you've got a contract, and we'd be happy to help you. If not, it's great seeing you." Um, so we we are engaged with. Uh, with did you spread? Did you just tell me the government wants stuff for free? <laughs> yeah, shocker. <laughs> shocker. Yeah, I, mean, I know you're all falling out of your chairs, but believe me, it happened. Um, so, and the interesting thing about it is, we across the board, 
Um, everyone is so urgently needing real practical cybersecurity capability to defend themselves against the onslaught of attacks that when they find that breath of fresh air, they'll do anything to be a part of that. And that very much has contributed to our early success. Um, I, I have to tell you, I'm a very optimistic person. Um, I would have never predicted that we would be as, as successful as we have been so far. So what, how did COVID impact all this? And, and is uh, it You know what, that's awesome and it's a great story. So uh, the team at the Tech Data Cyber Range I assembled are amazing talent. I call them the one percenters. That, and I, I truly know that this is top 1% level talent. Oh, and not bottom 1%. Not the bottom <laughs> That seems to be a goal that's already been achieved really well. Um, so we went to the other side, just, you know, low, low just for the down. giggles. All right. Yeah. So in any case, our team is incredibly versatile. And so when this uh, work from home thing dropped, uh, we actually had plans and our technology already supported uh, virtual events. So all we did was we moved next year's plans up. And within three weeks, we made the full pivot, and we are doing multiple virtual events every week. Uh, I think they've done four this week alone. Well, so uh, very fast pivot. It worked really well. We're still profitable. Again, we're not a profit center per se, but uh, the, the key is I don't want to be a giant stone around tech data's neck. Uh, so we are uh, highly engaging. We have a cost offset structure that allows us to not you know, drag tech data down. And because of there's so much energy going on, it's been very, very helpful and very successful. Nice. nice. And it's in the middle of nowhere, the, right? Uh, tech data. Go on, Jerry. <laughs> I was say, how has tech data's acquisition changed your plans for the range and hmm. tech data's approach to cybersecurity in general? Well, uh, as we are still in the acquisition strategy uh, phase, there's a very limited amount of things that I can actually discuss. Otherwise, I'll go meet the very not charming people at the SEC. Um, I can tell you that the hedge fund that bought us, we essentially Warren Buffett and this hedge fund got into a little bit of a bidding war and the uh, hedge fund won. And uh, that hedge fund is known for investing in big ideas. So they essentially go to big idea places and say, what can you do with it? What do you need to get that done? And how can we help? And so uh, I will simply say, uh, unrelated, uh, tech data's biggest cyber idea is to the tech data cyber range. So I would imagine that there might be some interest from them in the tech data cyber range. Nice. nice. Excellent. Nice. So, you know, par prior to this uh, starting off, we talked a little bit about I had watched a segment, I think it was 60 Minutes, on, on deep fakes. And yeah. this, whole, this whole arena of deep fakes is, it's actually quite scary when you think about it. They're getting better every day. And, you know, as they show demonstrations from a political perspective, right, Obama saying things that he didn't say or Trump saying things he didn't say or whatever, I think it's, it's going to lead to a lot of chaos, potentially, especially with our elections. But even more so on a broader scale, I've heard the same kind of impacts where a CEO was, his voice was deep fake, and he released some, two, and the company gave away $244,000, I think it was, to somewhere in Africa. So what are your, what are your thoughts so, on this whole deep fake thing? Yeah, so technology oftentimes leaves humanity behind. So people can't think about everything that it takes to live every minute of every day. It's just too much stuff. So humans are forced to make assumptions and live on observation. So a deep fake is an incredibly insidious threat because you're looking at the person. It sounds like their voice. And so do you believe your eyes and ears or not? And that's literally a cultural cliche. I believe what I see and hear. And so Deep fakes strike at the very heart of that crutch or trust or cheat or however you want to, to uh, characterize it. It's all of those. And so because of that, no one really has the time to actually bet did they or would they have said that. And so, yes, it is causing a great deal of chaos. It will likely continue to do so because the only alternative is to simply not believe your eyes and ears which is going to be almost impossible for humans to 
transition to. I mean, I'm a uh, philosophy anthropology are my degrees, and because of that, I know for a fact that humanity doesn't have it within them to distrust their own senses. Uh, yes. So uh, the the tech data cyber range, we operate uh, threat intelligence through the a partnership again with the foundation called the CWR ISAO Information Sharing Analysis Organization, and we are we are we are likely the largest threat intelligence in the world. Um, I'm not guessing on that one, but I'm not ready to be overly declarative on that particular topic. So let's just say we're really big. And we are seeing an unparalleled amount of activity, especially in information warfare area. And deep fakes plays a critical role in all of that because all you have to do is get people into an emotional state, kind of where we are right now, and then you are you're easily able to manipulate them to whatever nefarious end you have. So we have been pushed up into an emotional state, and now with information warfare doctrine and deep fakes, you can really capitalize on that. And I can tell you that from what I'm seeing, that's being done. Hey, Jeremy, you ever read Neil Stevenson's The Fall? It's the sequel to Red May. And so in that, in that, it brings up an interesting point is, the, the counter to deep fakes or in general misinformation, right? In, in the case in, in the fall, basically they generate a nuclear act, a fake nuclear incident in uh, Moab, Utah. And they, they use that as, as a way of people to become distrustful of information in general. So the, the defense is actually to, to collapse the concept of news itself. Right, yeah. whether it's aggressive or defensive, yeah. they implode it, and so I mean, we we I, I, I normally don't change the topic from Brett to Jeremy, but I mean, Jeremy, you ever think about what would be the defense against deep fake besides just recognizing it? Is there a sociological or cultural hack that we would use against deep fake in order to immune people to it? It's kind of like who picks up an unknown caller anymore, right? We've all learned, Nobody. even even if it's your parents' number, it's like, ah, it's not, it's not saying my parents, can't be them, right? I mean, right. Is, there, is there a moment or a mechanism by which that's what happens? We become immune to deep fake because of X. Like, is there a way that we implode our, our authentication button? Hmm. That's a, that's a, a, this is an interesting problem to solve. Is that a second beer question and not a first beer question? <laughs> it, it might be. It's, and I'm not, I mean, this is really fruity, by the way. So it's, and it's kind of like bubbly. So I'm not really into it. No offense for people who enjoy this beer. So, but, so uh, you might swap. There's no harm <laughs> swapping. I had a terrible beer the other day. I had to swap out. It's, it's not terrible. It's just not what I'm in the mood for. Maybe that's well, a better way of saying it. There you go. I'm gonna We're switch. Going back I'm to gonna switch. We have that last. I'm switching time. back to the Lost Coast Hazy. Another yeah, Hazy IPA. It's just, good. Uh, it's just so Brett, good. So, I mean, Brett, what are you seeing technology-wise that that you say, "Oh my God, I've never seen anybody ever create a product like this." Like, I mean, some people they look at TiVo, and I'm trying to get um, uh, Tony Cole to be on a call with me, right? And we can do one of these with Tony. But, but to tell you the truth, I mean. Honeypots and Deceptive have been there. It's just been more elegant and more easier to use with the Optivo solution, right? All of a sudden now, it's been operationalized, the best way to put it. I mean, what are you seeing that you say, I never expected this stuff to be operationalized, right? I mean, are you seeing anything that you found like, oh my God, this is pretty cool. I, I, I want my own toy. Uh, yeah, that happens to be more often than you think. So yeah. uh, the, uh, <laughs> one of the interesting things that is impressing me is the fact that there continues to be a lot of innovation and investment in innovation on the bad guy side of the world. So the whole world is so bad at cybersecurity, they could easily get by with less and they could literally stop doing R&D and still have a solid 10 year effectiveness cycle. In so you're, you're saying that if you're a VC looking for a C or a D round to invest in before pre IPO, look at investing into the attackers because they have, just better return on investment? You're vastly better investment. And having worked very closely with investment capital, it is, it is a vastly superior business option. 
Uh, wow. <laughs> well, and, but that speaks to the fact that most of my peers are so bad at their job and they're unwilling to have the integrity to quit or get better. I mean, that's the most important thing. You're on the, the more harder side. So, so what's the tech? What's the tech that you really like? I mean, is there something really cool? Yeah, so uh, there are two areas. I already talked about the deep fakes. Um, by the way, quick tip. If you're watching a deep fake video, they never blink. So that's one way to tell, but that's almost impossible for you to really detect. But, something we just but I read a follow-up article on that, Brett, and they've actually took that advice, and now they've fixed the AI to start making them blink like normal. What was the one where, where only one eye blinks? Is that the marionettes? It's a marionettes. Only one eye ever blinks on the marionettes. <laughs> but anyways, go on. Yeah, but see, that's an innovation, right? So we discovered that there's a thing. There's still no major counter to that. And yet they're like, oh, man, they're onto us. And they keep moving forward, further leaving our cybersecurity groups behind. That and uh, something that's extremely common these days is multi-stage infection. So that's a counter to all the correlation rules that are out there. So yeah. bad guys find out. Hey, there's this thing called correlation, man. They're going to figure out that we did this, this, and this, and then that was all related. So what they do is they do multi-stage time differentiated infection, and because of that, it really makes it hard to correlate without either creating a Cartesian product in data, right, or like completely going off on the wrong tangent. It's literally just you know rabbit hole. So uh, they, that continued innovation to me is extremely impressive, uh, and you know, it, it is, if you look at it from a business standpoint, they are over investing in R&D because they don't need it to gain the returns that they're doing, and yet they continue to do so. So you might ask yourself the question, why would they do that? If you don't have to, why do they do that? And I would propose to you that um, there's more than just criminals behind all of this stuff. You're dealing with essentially a nation state world. So I'm no stranger to the really? hacking world. Um, and I've been involved for a long time in that world. And I can tell you that the idea of an individual hacktivist is essentially gone. Either you are helping a state-based actor or you know absolutely nothing and you just, you're, you know, trying to get into the party. So um, because of that, what drives the overinvestment is the doctrines of war. And so if you're a company or even a small company, you're fighting against all of the enemies of the Western world and all of their funding and all of their investment. Do you think that it is possible, fighting alone, that you will be successful? Do you think that you are too small or too irrelevant to be skipped over by this kind of resourced enemy? So and if you're gonna... is yes, you need to rename yourself the victim because that's exactly what you're going to be. So you have to begin to collect. Where's your soapbox? <laughs> I mean, look, the, the best fields are made with great fertilizer. So if your company wants to be fertilizer, then I'm going to laugh as you go under. <laughs> so, so what's the tech though? What tech do you say? Oh my God, do you at least at least use this? This is pretty cool. I've, I haven't seen this before. You know, you, know, there, there, isolation you can name drop a company. You won't offend us around here. Just name drop a company. Say, I really like this company. This is. This yeah, so I don't want to name a specific because browser isolation, there are several vendors out there. They're all pretty darn like good. Like Molino to security, Molino. Yeah, Anyways. Across yeah. the board. And, and, and so interestingly enough, what I love about that technology is it defends us from dumb users, right? So uh, Tech Data has been doing anti-phishing training for uh, more than three years. We have 14,000 some odd employees, and we still have eight employees that will literally click on anything that you send them. Like I, I actually put up to our security department, I said, do this. In the subject line, say, this is a phishing test. If you click on this, you will be fired. And I bet you still get the same click ratio. Well, uh, as long as the button says, see cute cats. Yeah. I'm, I'm one of the guys, I, I keep the cat videos going. My, my Apple news feed now knows that I like cat meow and I love cat. And, and I get tons of them. I'm quite happy with those. So I'm just going to take a couple of notes here, if you don't mind. Just <laughs> Unrelated, of course. Um, but uh, hey, keep clicking on that stuff, man. Look, I'm not going to do anything with that information you just gave me. I appreciate it. So, um, so you, like, you like the browser stuff. That's good. Now, yeah, browser isolation helps users 
um, be somewhat neutralized in their uh, uninformed activity, right? So I really love it for that reason. Um, you know, as work from home becomes a reality, one thing that I'm hearing a lot, more than I thought I ever would, is companies found out that when they sent all their people home, that they're just as effective, if not more effective, and they're happier. And so a lot wait, of companies, big wait, companies. Wait, wait, Al, what do we discover when companies sent people home? <laughs> Besides the, the, the corn word, um, yeah. we, found, we found the number one activity was shopping. 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 Uh, you would think Netflix. Like shopping, here's the pandemic, and yet you expect every well, else in the world to manufacture something and you to, to ship it to your house, be, but, but you get to stay at home the whole time. Yeah, so it was, I think, in this order. Shopping, it was... Um, uh, not uh, gaming sites, I think. Was gaming, then streaming oh, videos. Streaming video, Netflix, stuff like that. Yeah, like but sure. shopping was number one. Paper, you spent more hours yeah, well, shopping. Everybody's looking for toilet paper. Right. Toilet paper, <laughs> Lysol. I mean, if you can't <laughs> find that. I keep going. Because you, you don't give up. Like sometimes. Brand, and that's an important item. <laughs> the skip, well, I'm just yeah, saying. Maybe sometimes they Amazon, Amazon will drop it. And it'll be there. And they're like, there's, they got a pallet in. And they're going to put 15 things of toilet paper. And the first 15 people who refresh at that exact minute get the toilet paper. <laughs> and it's, 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 like a, it's like a video game. You get kind of frantic and get into it. It's uh, that's what I, yeah. almost anyway, like a bidding. My site. wife. My <laughs> wife did that. I think you might be appropriate. So, so but, Brad, let me just flip it around. So besides... What, what is the question where a customer comes to you and says, hey, Brett, here's my problem. What's a good solution? And you just have to look at them and say, you're, you're screwed. I mean, what's the number one way in which people talk to you and say, listen, you're in, you're in Neverland. It's not, it's not going to happen. You're not going to find a product that does that. I mean, do you, or do you always just try to help them out? Are you the nice guy? There's no part of my lineage in, that has French. So because of that, um, I'm in this fight to win. No it. surrender, huh? No surrender, exactly. And so, yeah, it's daunting. If you look at the incredible <laughs> wave that's coming at you, you can panic and run away, which vive la France, right? Or you can stand up and say, not me. I'm not going to be the one that goes down. So it, it's something that if you're going to give up, at least have the integrity to shut down, right? Because real people get hurt when you are bad at cybersecurity. Your customers, your employees, your friends, all of those people suffer when you stink at cybersecurity. So do us all a favor and get out. Like Burger King still needs fry cooks. There are all kinds of great jobs that don't involve cyber. Um, so just-, just I don't think fry, fry cook's a great job, but go on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, if you make good French fries, we're gonna be French for a long time. <laughs> That'd be McDonald's. <laughs> McDonald's fries. I'm so, gonna McDonald's fries. So I gotta, I gotta win out. out. A couple of, ep oh, Jeremy, you had something? Yeah. I just say in and out fries. That's the best. Yeah, in and out. He, Jeremy's still on the deep fake thinking. Uh, if only I can make uh, Vegas win on uh, game seven. <laughs> or he could have like it could have photoshopped the puck going in, that one goalie save with a kick. If we if we circle back to the deep fake yeah. conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's still in your head. Is there is there a technology that can that can determine true fake or not fake. Is that something that's accessible outside of the .gov? Is that there something are, that's commercially available? Yeah, there are counters that are there. If you look at the people who publish deep fake libraries, many of them have. Here are the counter steps. Here are the ways that you could detect that. Uh, oh my that God. On. So the same people who are, if you will, enabling the technology are also saying, here's how you defeat this. Thing. You, you want me to give us some awesome. easy ones, Jeremy? Skin, <laughs> skin, co skin tone um, analysis. So, so sure. one of the biggest issues around artificial analysis is that their curves are too exact. So randomness is never random. And so when they generate deep fakes, the skin tones are too consistent and they don't match sometimes if they're just changing the face. Right, so there's there's all sorts. If I of, look blotchy, this is really me, and if I'm not blotchy, <laughs> I'm fake. 
There you go. Kind of like the magazines <laughs> with all the models in it, right? <laughs> nobody's nobody's perfect except your wife. That's what I've learned. <laughs> nice. Well, and by the way, a great way to continue forward. You, you got uh, that right. That's an absolute. Uh, so Jeremy and, and Chris and I were talking uh, with a guy from Pepling uh, who does a Peter. lot. Peter, awesome, that's, great guy. It's SD Wan, right? And, and with this whole notion of work from home, Brett, oh. again, we go back to employees doing their employee behavior, their personal <laughs> behavior, bringing that into work. And the problem, right, is I just read another article that said more than 50% of the time, they're probably skirting some of the cybersecurity policies and practices that the companies are giving them. So you take that and you take this now fully distributed network, which they could be operating on their own home system or whatever, right? That's very problematic to, 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 for cybersecurity professionals to get a hold of. Well, companies are facing a double whammy, right? So the work from home, obviously nobody was prepared for that. Everybody was like, oh man, my perimeter, and oh, I got to do all this endpoint, the perimeter and endpoint, you know, we got to invest in that. And they have. Um, but when people leave their house to go work somewhere else because they're bored at home, how, how are you going to do anything about that? And so uh, it's a double Jeremy, whammy. write down Sandblaster again. <laughs> Sandblast Mobile. Yeah. Checkpoint. We're uh, checkpoint guys. We got to get them on. <laughs> mobile threats are massive. Well, so uh, for example, in Hong Kong, they have all of this demonstrations and there's all this uh, thumb down on all the democracy stuff. They're, they are reneging on their promise of two systems. And so uh, the Chinese uh, APT level groups invented a whole bunch of iOS zero days. Well, we know for a fact that it doesn't take long for those to then bleed out to the regular world. So they were using it against dissidents in Hong Kong, but those things are now bleeding out. And so uh, a lot of people um, mistakenly believe that iPhones are more secure. And because of that, they, the whole group of them is unprepared for the massive number of new zero days that are going to drop for iPhones. Uh, and there are a lot of, I mean, it's not just my iPhone. That's just the largest encounter zone. There are still new malware for uh, Android. And uh, you, you're, you're seeing now that mobile is a very high profile target because A, you still get lots of compute and B, most people don't know how to secure your phone. Like if, if, if I said to you, hey, I know your phone's infected. What are you going to do? Their answer is, I have no idea. And I don't want to because I don't want to lose, stop using my phone. So uh, that, of course, is why the bad guys are targeting that particular platform because you don't know what to do and you wouldn't you wouldn't want to do it anyway. That's what you know. Why do you rob the banks? Well, that's because where that's where the money is, right? So because they you're not going to be able to counter them, that's a good place to invest your time and effort as a bad guy. So so we brought up you know only half jokingly Sam, but I, so what what besides the checkpoint solution do you feel is a good solution out there for the mobile right now? You know. Uh, I would say that most of these solutions that are out there are not terribly matured yet. Um, I know that Trend has got some pretty neat stuff, uh, and and you've got some of the classic uh, applications like Lookout um, and uh, the on, on the Android side, Google is making a ser somewhat serious attempt to try to identify and block malware apps or, or malicious apps. So it's right now you just have a bunch of people moving in on the answer, but nobody really has the answer per se yet. So, 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 yeah. so like I said, I'm going to I mean, really put, go, okay, go on. I'm going to ask a tech data question. I was, I, was, I was just going to add to that. Maybe MDM in the corporate environment has some value, right? Where you can manage the fleet of devices and you can lock them down, whether that's Intune or, you know, mobile iron or, or whatever, right? But those are that would help. But that but that's just a layer of security, right? And then you still need a product like check the Sandblast Mobile to come in underneath that and actually look at the process level data, which is something that the MDM doesn't do. Yeah, yeah I was just, I was going to wonder, Brett. I mean, are companies coming up with a strategy to say, "Hey, I want to limit the hardware footprint to iPhone or hardware footprint to a particular Android Android version"? I mean, are they trying to proactively go against this for people who really give a crap or are you seeing them being more laissez-faire saying I'm trying to find an all-encompassing solution because I don't want to pay for that end device? Um, 
integrated solutions are a big priority for the security buyers that are out there because they're already overwhelmed with 10 million tools that don't all work together and they're trying to fuse it in their head and that, you know, out, they're out scale. Um, so that's what their priority is. They're not going to get there easily because a lot of people don't really offer that level of solution for folks. Mm. Um, but ultimately, uh, for the security people, it's a really daunting challenge because there are so many different flavors of both the operating systems, primary operating systems for mobile out there that it's sort of, I mean, right now, if you are trying to defend Windows systems, you got like six or seven operating systems you got to cover, and that's pretty much it. Mobile platform, you're talking about easily 100. Um, just for Android, and then for iOS, to be to be honest with you, you're probably still talking about 50. So okay. uh, it, it's almost impossible to to maintain 150 different upgrade and migration paths and evaluation paths and things like that. So companies, security companies especially, are simply out of scale. They just don't know how to do this, um, and they don't. They just when they begin to think about how they would do it, they're like, well, we just can't afford it. We have to charge a million dollars for our phone. So, so I'm not going to go the the French route for you, right? Not yeah, I'll you. call it the I'll call it the Galaxy Quest, right? Never, <laughs> sur never surrender, never <laughs> retreat, <laughs> right? Exactly. So, so w what are you going to recommend to these guys, right? What is what is the answer? Well, so you can shift your vital data off of your phone or put it in an MDM, right? Put it in one of your secure containers on an MDM. The, uh, when I uh, the phone numbers that I have in my phone book are aliases. So I know that if I'm looking at this character and that character, it's probably so-and-so. And because of that, it reduces the overall risk of data breach data off of my phone. So I'm not accepting that I'm willing to just give up, but I'm also trying to limit damage should I get into a situation where that's the case. And I also will do things like uh, keep a, a base image of my phone. So if I ever get the feeling that something's going wrong, I can re-image my phone back to something that I felt comfortable with last time. And that's definitely something that, that's something that corporate departments can do for you. I mean, it is possible to hand in your phone over lunch, come back and have it re-imaged. So uh, that's something worth considering. The yep. beauty of the blue screen of death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's okay. uh, but uh, there, there are a lot of different ways that you can do that. I, on My phone is mostly a voice over IP phone, which means, I am rarely using a cellular network, which also allows me to choke point malicious activity because it's going through my regular network. And I'm also then allowed to observe what it is doing. And if my, my network defenses go, hey, this device, that's your phone, is doing something dumb, uh, then I can say, oh, uh, my phone probably has a problem here. So it allows me to, um, because I'm choke pointing the egress of data, it allows me to get a better observation of that. And to be honest with you, uh, that's the that's the future anyway. Like a VoIP phone is absolutely the way to go. So I'd like to explore a little bit further on that, that comment you made around cellular. So today we know that that they can put uh, fake cellular intercepts up for people's phones and stuff, and that was during the 4G phase. My question is, is with the technology with 5G, how does that change the game in terms of the nefarious actors coming in and potentially even taking more advantage? of these mobile devices. You mean besides plants not being able to grow and us all dying and exploding? And causing COVID-19 <laughs> all the other issues, right, that, uh, that are out there. There's that information warfare thing again, right? Yep. Um, yeah, so 5G is higher intensity radio signal over shorter distances. And so the uh, your handoffs become more frequent than if you're using a cellular network or even a wireless network. And because of that, uh, you know, it took the problem that was already being not well uh, solved and throws the, the can way much further down the road. It's going to be really hard for people to uh, defend a, a mobile phone in the era of 5G. Um, so you will get your porn faster. But, and by the way, thank you, Chris. I, I, got, that, I got that in there. Just want to point out that I got <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you, you will also not be able to know where it's going. So um, I actually did a project where the software on the phone detects malicious hops. So it is constantly looking at the stuff around you and, if you will, geo maps the, the points where you would be communicating. And therefore, it is able to detect anomalies like, well, there's a much stronger version of this thing I used to talk to 
suddenly it's three times as strong as what it was, you know, the last 10 times I was near it, and I'm pretty sure it's not an upgrade, so that must mean that I'm, I'm dealing with Stingray or other listening device that's mimicking the cell tower. And so because of that, you, it, is a, it is a problem that you can address and resolve. The problem is almost nobody possesses the knowledge to do that, right? So that's, that knowledge is not common. You, I don't know that most phone personnel are even aware of that. And to, to support that contention, um, there are mobile <laughs> phone towers, big towers outside of military bases, and nobody knows how they got there or who but they are. So we'll, we'll talk to Georgia one day. <laughs> yeah, she'll, she'll 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 <laughs> Try doing wireless in Washington, D.C., and it is stunning how much nefarious wireless surveillance is going on. And that's not the U.S. government. They, they, I don't mind it's nefarious as long as my call goes through. I'm driving by Langley. It drops all the time because they don't let South Towers there. Yeah, I mean, well, come on. You know, Keep in mind that if you ignore cell towers, the problem goes away. Because there you go. There's your Doctor Strange love uh, security. Um, so it isn't my call. <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess the, the message is, hold on, because it, the game's changing that even more so with 5G and the and the the pressure to get 5G to market as fast as we can. And in this desperate failure of our industry and security. There is opportunity, right? And so, again, just we started the call talking about cyber ranges and how there are all these charlatans and people pretending or memeing that their cyber lab is actually a cyber range. And then there are a few people that are actually making a cyber range. The same thing is true. If you offer security solutions that actually do the job, then you're going to gain a great deal of market share because customers want to be secure. And that is true of young people, that's true of old people. They just don't want to have to go through 50 steps to be more secure. So if you make it easy for the user to just be and do their thing, and then your technology augments and does what it does and lets the humans do what they do and they work together, you get this huge benefit. So in the greater chaos of the cauldron, if you will, there is hope in that now we might be able to justify the investment in just doing it right and not half stepping in or do some some sort of thing meaning security and the the results could be profound uh for the business that invests that way oh my god we're done